welcome, welcome travelers. travelers. We we're, were aware that, that your journey was difficult, but prepare to have your questions answered, for you have been granted an audience with the Masters of Mod. Uh, music, music, music. <laughs> It, you, you don't need to say it because like uh, uh, but I, just, I feel like i'm supposed to do what alex does. it's true it's true yeah all right <laughs> music 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 and welcome back to the masters of modern it's me your host michael grothy here with marshall james hi there uh yeah uh, alex and ben are both at a commission so it's uh it's us two today yeah Marshall's uh, usually the producer, ooh. so you might recognize his voice, but you might not recognize his face because he's usually off camera. This is my face. I have one. And now we've more all than seen just it. a voice. I'm more than just a faceless wonder. Yeah, so uh, we figured that rather than kind of continuing to go over Eldraine cards with like, you know, what we think is going to be good in the set, uh, we wanted that to be more of an Alex and Ben thing. So, but we have started to see modern results with Eldraine. So we're going to start talking about what Eldraine stuff is actually showing up and talk about kind of potential sleeper hits uh, when Alexander or Ben is back. Yeah, yeah. So we've already had um, a several modern leagues on Magic Online where uh, Throne of Eldraine has been legal. And we also have... A modern that? challenge. A modern challenge. Which and, we have the top 32 lists from. Yeah, so there have been a lot of uh, exciting cards, and uh, so we got a bunch of fun decks to go over, some sweet brews that we've been um, watching or that we've seen finish uh, well in these events and kind of talk about them and talk about what we think the yeah, new Yeah, what's interesting is like modern, modern isn't like. totally shaken up. So if these are s- successful, like they're fighting against the typical, you know, Jund, Blue White, Tron humans pillars of the format that you expect to see so these are like somewhat more proven than the standard where standard like just face rotation is a huge shake up so you're seeing all these awesome standard brews but like in two months how many of them are really going to be playable you know but modern it's you have to play against these tried and true decks already and you have to hold your own so i think a lot of these decks are showing some promise yeah and uh as we were talking about just last week one of the big standouts has been emery lurker of the lock yeah showing up in a lot of the urza decks now which are now playing um wishing witching well as well and uh paradoxical outcome yeah well uh, some of them some of them are paradoxical outcome decks now instead of thopter sword decks right, right. um which they win just by making a lot of mana and then uh yeah they're, they're using playing like urza a nexus bunch. of fate so you can like do Nexus of Fady stuff. Okay, so we've got a Sahili Sublime Ar- Ar- Artificer w- as a win condition. Um, and then we also have uh, one Nexus of Fate, obviously, and a Psy Master Thopterus. So you're looking to go very wide with Thopters and or Servos, similar to the uh, Thopter Sword decks. You're not relying on your graveyard, um, which is interesting. Uh, I mean, obviously, Emery us- utilizes your graveyard, but you don't really need, like, if somebody, you know surgical extracts something you don't care at all yeah it's really interesting that um we were talking before we started recording about how uh emery really doesn't need affinity like yeah tacking affinity onto her just makes her obscene like she's not quite urza insane but she's almost which Uh, is funny to be in a standard set well, that like artifact stuff can always fly under the radar in standard because if you want it to be good enough it has to be like Psy good and even side and really see play in standard because the artifact options are usually so poor mm-hmm. unless there's like explicitly an artifact set. Right. And then usually stuff's a little broken. Yeah. Although I guess the most broken part of the last artifact set was energy and the set before that, the most broken thing was Phyrexian mana. So I don't know. <laughs> 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 yeah, in general, letting people do things for colorless or for free, just always risky. Uh, it is interesting to see, speaking of like energy, we were talking earlier about the role of food. And food really does feel like a kind of fixed version of energy, how it's now sort of sussing out in uh, in standard. It's like an energy that's slightly harder to accumulate a more uh, interesting in how it's spent, but then it's also like energy that can always be cashed in for food. Well, for it's, also, life. it's interesting because it's like really slowing down um, standard and limited environments because like even if you're not like a food deck that's looking to use it like energy using payoffs like Cauldron Familiar or Wicked Wolf or whatever, you're still, you just like, 
we'll play a bacon to a pie because it's a premium removal spell in draft. And then you're like, oh, now I just have three extra life. So like my opponent's aggressive night deck is going to have a little bit more trouble closing out the game with a combat trick or something, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I've noticed like the, the standard and limited environments being much slower because of food. I don't think we're going to see that carry over into modern, even though we're starting to see some Okos show up. But I mean, I do think that like having Oko in your deck is randomly going to gain you six life against a burn deck and you're going to win. <laughs> yeah, I, there were, I, I played in the pre-release over the weekend and there were several matches where I lost because my opponent was able to gain like the critical amount of life off of piece of food that kept yeah. them alive. I also lost once because of a beloved princess, like one one point of life gain, and then the fact that I was going to have to swing back through her and she was going to gain that one more point of life. It was like so frustrating. Underestimate the my, beloved princess. My my card pool was pretty uh, weak to begin with. So, and I I think we were talking also before we started recording about how much more powerful adventure feels when you're actually playing with it than it seems on paper. Yeah, I mean all the all the adventure cards are two for ones, and I think that's pronounced in sealed, especially at the pre release. I would be I'll be interested to see how it does in draft as the draft format shows up. And in fact, I'll be interested to see how it shows up in Modern, which it has. Um, the main adventure cards that we saw this week, uh, this weekend from Modern tournaments on Magic Online uh, were, we saw a, this one I screenshotted so I can find it in my, we saw a Traverse uh, Shadow deck, which is the Jund version of the Death Shadow decks. Um, these were like the original Death Shadow decks before people started playing Grixis with Stubborn Denial, and they were playing Traverse the Ulvenwald because you're generally like a pretty threat light deck. You can use Traverse the Ulvenwald to um, find more Death Shadows to kill them with. Um, but they're now playing one Murderous Rider, one Bone Crusher Giant main deck, or at least this one that. Uh, that got top 32 in the challenge. Mm. Um, so you can find them with Traverse if you need to like find a spell. So I was like pretty low on Murderous Rider and by extension Bone Crusher Giant when we were talking about the cards on the podcast. But I, this is definitely a situation where you want these to be creatures and the fact that like the lose two life doesn't matter to you because you're Death Shadow. Right. So in like, fact, it's it's better than Hero's Downfall for Death Shadow. Right. I also think that like having played a little bit of standard on arena, I underestimated the lifelink like in matchups where three mana heroes downfall lose two life is going to be too slow, like mono red or something like that. You just play it for three mana and those decks are actually going to have to like spend a card to kill it or they're going to lose to it because right. the lifelink is relevant. And it having three toughness is really relevant too. Cause it tangos with a lot of two twos. Yeah. It can't be killed by bone crusher giant or shock. Um, and Bone Crusher Giant is the same. I mean, like, it's pretty inefficient as a shock, but, like, if you need it, you need it. A lot of the time, you're it's it's pretty easy to trade evenly with it, I think. Like, just deal two damage to a two drop and kill it, and then you just get, like, a free 4-3 that is really big. And will punish <laughs> them for trying to get rid of it? Yeah. I mean, in, in, yeah. in standard, I was, like, it was getting killed by, like, a planeswalker or whatever a lot of the time or like they'd make me sacrifice it with priest of the forgotten gods or whatever and i'm like well whatever all right you don't take two but you know it was just a two for one right like they had to spend a card to get rid of it or a planeswalker activation or something a planeswalker minus and i got to like shock something or right. shock face yeah like at the minimum all the adventure cards are two for ones and um and so as a result almost all of the uh, ones that have a removal spell as their adventure, so that's Murderous Rider, the the Giant, the uh, Brazen Borrower. Yeah, I so I was I've been playing um, an Is It Flash list that I got from Ryan Overturf. Um, he posted on Twitter. He streamed it. I did not get to watch the stream, but I stole the list off of Twitter. Uh, <laughs> and I'm playing four Brazen Borrower, four Bone Crusher Giant, and I was really appreciating. Um, the the adventures yeah i mean on brazen borrower like a lot of the time you're incurring card disadvantage or you're spending a lot of mana to bounce something like you're spending four mana for cryptic to bounce or you are you know using echoing truth or vapor snag or something and you're incurring card disadvantage but brazen borrowers like being a two mana bounce spell that draws a card as an instant just like it gets you out of so many situations where you just like pass with two mana up they like play something big like a rotting regisaur or something or a questing beast and you can just like 
bounce it, draw a card, basically. You draw a 3-1 flash, but right. that's something that hopefully your deck wants if you're playing it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a 3-1 with flash is not nothing because it, it having flash means it's sort of like a lightning bolt against an attacking creature, and uh, and it's a real clock. Like, that's the reason why Delver Secrets was such a scourge for a while. A three-power flyer um, is, uh, is a real real threat yeah totally and so uh actually speaking of brazen brazen borrower and a uh blue red flash deck style deck in general there is a list that top 32 the challenge uh that is a, a blue red flash basically uh and it's playing kiki jiki pestermite as its main win condition and it is playing two brazen borrower uh as well as four briarhorn cutthroat which is a card making an appearance from standard it's the two one flash uh, that whenever you play a spell on your opponent's turn, it gets a plus one plus one counter. Oh, it's two mana, one and a blue. Yeah. Um, so it's super real easy good just with like, uh, Brazen Borrower because it gets two counters from each half of the borrower. Yeah, there's so many times where I like pass with three mana up and I have a counter spell. They play something that I don't think is worth countering. They play like a Doofus or like they play a tap land and say go or something. And I just like Briarhorn opt attack for three, unta- like, pass with all my mana untapped, and it just, like, gets so big so fast, and even more so in modern where you have access to, like, force of negation <laughs> and uh, four lightning bolt, four opt, two peak, four remand, two spell snare. I mean, those are, and four snapcaster mage. Those are, like, tons of, like, premium cheap interaction that just, like, makes it really hard for your opponent to get rid of this borrower, and it's just going to be, like, a 5-4 or a 6-5 in no time. You can use your Brazen Borrower to like clear the way of blockers. Also, this deck is playing three Cryptic, which you can use to clear the way of blockers. Um, and it even in standard, I found I found it super easy to just like make one big Brazen Borrower hit them a couple of times and burn them out. And in modern, where you have access to like Snapcasters and Lightning Bolts, it seems like no problem. To yeah, just have a Brian Born Cutthroat go all the way if they don't respect it. I've been playing a similar deck in standard, so I'm really excited to see this break into modern, and I might end up trying it because I probably have all these. I don't have key keys, but yeah, I wonder it's if it's hard to acquire. Uh, so Brineborn was also seeing a lot of play in the Simic Flash deck that a lot of people were excited about it post rotation because it was losing almost nothing. Um, yeah. And it, uh, the having watched the Simic Flash deck do its thing on streams, I wonder if that's almost strong enough to also make a port into modern. I mean, playing during your opponent's turn always feels good. Totally. So the proliferance of flash creatures and creatures that give you value for playing flash strategies yeah. um, has really ticked up this year. So Yeah, I don't I don't think I was on the episode of the set review for 2020 that talked about Brineborn Cutthroat, so I don't know if I really thought about it in a modern context very carefully, but I do feel like the power level is pretty close. Being a 2-1 means that, like, it does die to Lava Dart if they, like, if you run it out with no untapped mana or you, like, um, or they, like, respond to your trigger if you, like, go Brineborn opt end of turn or something. Um, but it doesn't really die to Ren and Six because, like, you're never... It's never going to be just like a 2 1 on their turn when they like, you're just, you're not going to like sorcery speed it out on turn two and be like, go, oh, oh, Ren and Six, no. Uh-huh. Like, um, so that's not really an issue. But, but I do like think that 2 1s in general have, or any one toughness creature, Brazen Borrower included, unfortunately, have like kind of a target on their back because of Ren and Six. But Flash goes a long way because with Brazen Borrower, you can like flash it on their end step and hit Ren and Six before they have a chance to activate and then finish it off with a bolt or something. Or maybe yeah. you've already hit it or, you know. And even if you can, even if it has like its four loyalty and you flash in, you swing into it for the three, then they have to decide, do they want to sack their Ren and Six to kill your Brazen Borrow, which feels like a good trade at that point. Right, yeah. I mean, the the fact that these X-1s have flash goes a long way in doing a little bit of work against Ren and Six. Also with Brazen Borrow in particular, you've already gotten value there is a potential for you to have already gotten value by the time they can kill it because you can like bounce a key permanent to like force through a brine horn cutthroat brine born cutthroat i always want to call it brine horn right when i was building my deck it's born of the brine i'm the alex i'm the alex today and uh, (laughs) marshall's the ben Uh and i (laughs) and so yeah in arena when i was searching for it to put it in my deck i literally typed brine horn and nothing showed up and i was like what you Where's did. this card? So I like delete, delete, delete until it was just Brian and then it showed up. Uh, born. <laughs> Brian Born. Yeah, it doesn't have horns. Horns made no, of Brian. it's not. I don't know um, why I want to call it that. Yeah, so the Paradoxical Outcome decks 
this this list uh, that five out of league from Rav one oh four was playing uh, four Emery four Urza one Psy three Sahili the Sublime Artificer yeah the win cons uh uh-huh. and then it has four paradoxical outcome and then its artifacts are four of each Arkham's Astrolabe engineered explosives Mishra's Bobble Ant- Mox Amber Mox Opal and then one Pyrite Spellbomb one Witching Well two four each of the Amber and Opal. So that deck that you're looking at is also playing four Jeskai Ascendancy. Oh, and it's a Jeskai Ascendancy, paradoxical. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it when was... we talked about Jeskai Ascendancy with Emery, yeah, we were saying that that allows you, like, we've seen Jeskai Ascendancy shells with Mana Dorks or Fate Stitcher, and just playing four Fate Stitcher is, like, maybe not enough Dorks to really go off with it consistently, but with also four Noble Hierarch, but then you're in four color. And this is, like, just a three color deck that's basically just splashing white for Ascendancy. <laughs> And Ascendancy plus Ascendancy with a zero cost artifact that sacrifices itself with Emery is an infinitely large Emery. Right. Um, so and, they are playing the full four Mox Amber, which it's interesting that like all the engine creatures for this deck, Psy, Urza, Emery, are all legendary. <laughs> yep. Yep. And then you're also playing Sahili, which counts for, em- for with, Amber. And it's pretty funny that you can go like turn one a land a mox amber a mox opal if that land was an island you can cast emery now you can (laughs) now you can tap and use your mox amber to play another to play like a witching well and now your mox opal can tap like you can literally barf your entire hand onto onto the table on turn one emery has affinity (laughs) right (laughs) we needed turn one emery to be a thing yeah and turn one emery is very real in in this deck yeah and it Uh, basically just draws you up to four cards and these decks are the paradoxical outcome decks are are often now playing uh, artifact lands too although i guess this one isn't because of jeskai ascendancy but the other list that i was looking at um the one that was just playing the one nexus of fate and then the the one ones as the win condition that list was playing dark seal citadel to make emery cheaper right um <laughs> yeah i mean not? why not uh so emery may be a mistake <laughs> yeah time will tell uh, okay, so we've got a bunch of other sweet lists that we saw. Um, this one that I really liked from uh, Davius Minimus uh, went, went 5 0 in a league, and it used Corridor Monitor as well as Charming Prince in a five color uh, uh, Prime Speaker Vanifar deck. So we, I think we briefly what do, touched. What do Charming Prince and Corridor Monitor do for the uh, yes. podcast listeners? So uh, Corridor Monitor is a two cost, costs one and a blue for, I believe it's a zero four. It's a one four. Oh, it's a one four artifact creature that when it enters the battlefield, it untaps target. Artifact or creature. Yeah. I had it in a, in a sealed pool and it was in my deck because I needed a two drop that blocked. <laughs> I mean, a one four for two is not bad. Yeah, like, no. like Horn Turtle was a limited all star for a I'll, while. I'll, I'll play it in draft. It's not the worst. Uh, so it's it's important uh, because it allows you to untap Prime Speaker Vanifar. So now, for the first time, we have a two drop in modern that does that untap game. Uh, so that now you can start with Vanifar and literally any creature and climb up the chain. Uh, you can sacrifice the Birds of Paradise, go get Corridor Monitor, Monitor untaps. Uh, Vanifar, then sack the the quarter monitor to go get what's the three drop? Do they, are they playing a Deceiver Exarch? I can't see. I don't one. see a Deceiver Exarch. Oh, you can get a Renegade Rallyer. Oh, you get a Renegade Rallyer. That's interesting. So this this card allows them to cut Deceiver Exarch because it's basically two mana Deceiver Exarch. Right. Right, and Renegade Rallyer is just much more versatile than Deceiver Exarch. So moving Deceiver yeah, Exarch down to the two plan, which like a lot of times these decks have to default into because if your opponent is playing Jund, they're just going to kill every Vanifar. Yeah, within a mile of the table. <laughs> right. So uh, yeah, and so the whole plan is to climb up to Kiki Jiki Resto Angel, and uh, once you got that, then you got infinite Resto Angels. Yeah, and then Charming Prince is is another flicker effect too. Also, it allows you to like rebuy your other ETBs, like your Eternal Witness that you're playing one of, and your one Knight of Autumn, and your Renegade Rallyers, and yeah, it's got a bunch of one ofs that are useful, like Deputy and Eternal Witness and Crater Maker and uh, that sort of thing. But Charming Prince does other stuff too, right? It also scries two or gains you three life. Yeah, when it enters the battlefield, you get to scry two, gain three life, or blink a permanent you control i so, i love by the way that 
they decided like, oh, we got to have a prince charming in this. So how do we represent a charming prince? And someone's like, ah, well, we have charms and magic. Let's make a creature that's a charm. A lot of punsters in R and D. But I also like we we were we were talking about um, another list that I want to talk about. That's a five O list from Fin Crown. That was Mono White Emiria, the Sky Ruin, and it's also playing Charming Princess. Four Charming Prince in there, and this Emiria deck is all about using blink effects like Charming Prince and uh, Flicker Wisp, along with like Sun Titan who buys back things to really abuse the ETBs of Wall of Omens, the Raven Inspector, Ranger Captain of Eos, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and the the thing that I really like uh, about Charming Prince is uh, Charming Prince specifically says, exile target creature you own, then return it to the battlefield under your control. So if someone has stolen a creature away from you with like Archmage's Charm or something, the Charming Prince charms that creature back to where it belongs, mm. which I... So Flicker Wisp can do that too, but Charming Prince does it at only two mana, along with some versatility. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that same uh, that same sort of ability to charm a creature so, that's wait, been... Oh. So that Amiria list is, is unusual. It's playing a couple of blue cards. Dude. It's playing Winds of Abandon, which I don't remember what that does. No, Winds of Abandon is the uh, Overload Path to Exile. Oh, that's sick, because it's like a slower, big white deck that can afford it. But it's also playing a uh, an Eldrain card, right? It's playing... Uh, I can't see it, because it looks like you've... Brought back. Brought back. Oh, no, no brought that was back our is, preview card. Yeah, brought back was our preview card. <sighs> For some reason, I totally misread those two cards and thought they were blue cards. Nope. So, yeah, so the, the deck is playing brought back. It's running uh, a bunch of fetch lands, the ve- Vistas, Heaths. Um, Do we have brought back up here? Oh, no, it didn't, didn't make the wall, but yeah. it's a good one. It's a good one. The deck also has one Crucible of Worlds to kind of act as a brought back effect. Um, and it also has a Kami of False Hope. So you can sort of play uh, a game with Sun Titan and brought backs and that sort of thing to be fogging against the decks you need yeah. to fog against. So it's kind of a fun deck. And then it ultimately plans to get up to Amiria the Sky Ruin, uh, which is a not legendary land. For a while, they were you experimenting have multiple around. Multiple Amirias, why not? I guess you can have multiple Castle Lockthwains yeah, and stuff can. now too. So, but uh, Amiria says, like at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control seven planes, you may return target creature from your graveyard to the battlefield. Yep. So uh, that's pretty good with creatures that have strong ETBs, and uh, and so I, I liked I liked uh, the role of Charming Prince there. But the one other Charming Prince list that I really like is one that utilizes. Uh, w- arguably the worst card <laughs> from Kaladesh, but like it 5 0 to league here. A dubious challenge. Ooh. We used to make jokes that putting this card in your deck uh, was a dubious challenge. <laughs> yeah, so somebody took up the dubious challenge. So, a uh, dubious challenge costs three and a green sorcery. Look at the top 10 cards of your library. Then exile up to two creatures from among them, then shuffle your library. Target opponent may choose one of the exile cards and put it onto the battlefield under their control. Put the rest onto the battlefield under your control. So the card lets you look at 10, pick two. Your opponent gets the first choice out of the two of them, and then you get the other one. Yes, if you flip like an Elish Norn or something, your opponent can just be like, I'll take that, and then you get the leftovers. Right, so it's like, why would you ever do this? Is it an instant or a sorcery? It's a sorcery. Okay. So there's lots Make of things going against this. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's it's got to be as bad as possible. So the goal of this deck that was run by KF Chicken to a 5-0 in a modern league is... Uh, the big creatures it has, it has four Emrakul, the Aeon's Torn, and two Iona, the, Sh- the Shield of Emeria. Uh, and the goal when you Dubious Challenge is to hopefully see one of those, but then the other, and so you exile it. The other creature you choose to exile is either a Charming Prince or a Flicker Wisp or a Trostani Discordant, because... Okay. Remind me what Tristani Discordant does. So Tristani Discordant is a five cost, costs three, a white and a green, and she's like a one four that has creatures you control have plus one plus one. When she enters the battlefield, make two one one, one okay, soldiers okay. with lifelink. And at the beginning of your end step, all players gain control of all permanents they own. Ooh. So between the prince charming your creature back, the flicker wisp flickering the creature back, and Tristani discording the creature back, 
uh, as long as, like, whichever one your opponent chooses, those cards only give them back to their owner, or can only, Charming Prince can only target a card you own. So they can never use Charming Prince. Like, if, they, if you reveal Charming Prince and Iona, and you exile them both, well, now they have the choice. They either choose Iona, which is immediately going to get Charmed yeah. back, or they choose Charming Prince, in which case you get the Iona, and they get to scry to. Which I guess that's technically the correct play, but they're probably <laughs> going to lose because your Iona is is going to be a little bit better than their Charming Prince. Right. I mean, I guess they can choose Iona, name White, and now you are also locked out of White, but you're locked out of White with an Iona. Oh, and then you flicker it with. Yeah, so then you, you get to. Ju- <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess if if you reveal if you get Tristani and they choose Iona and they name White, well, at the end of turn, I have Tristani and Iona, and I can't cast White spells anymore. But I still feel like I'm going to win the game. Yeah. You can have those two soldiers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that's pretty funny. I love the idea of charming Prince, charming Emra, cool the Aeons torn back. Like, come on, baby, take me back. <laughs> Don't be like that. <laughs> Don't tear the Aeons. Um, no. I also am of note, this deck is playing for Moss Warp Bridge. <laughs> oh man, I didn't even so see you that. you can win more if, if you already have like a bunch of creatures, like a Tristani pumping your team or like a, an Emrakul in play or something, you can just like, here's another Emrakul. <laughs> well, or like the other thing it could do, because you've got Tristani who's going to be, like Tristani herself puts out five power. Right. Uh, so that's halfway to a Moss Warp Bridge. Uh, Flickerworth's past three power, which is not insignificant, and the deck also runs four Blade Splicer, and which four, is four, and which is four power. So, arguably, you could just curve out like a green white Stompy deck and Moss Wart in an Iona or a F- Imrakul on like turn five and still feel pretty good. Yeah, it gives you like another plan to put it into play if Dubious Challenge turns out to be a bit too dubious. Mm hmm. And you know, uh, four ephemerate, which allows you to make more tokens with Tristani or more golems of blade splicer. I guess you can also like ephemerate your charming prince to like scry deep to like find your combo pieces. Right. Like it, it could be funny if you dubious challenge and there doesn't seem to be like if you have a charming prince on in play and an ephemerate in hand, then dubious challenge is completely safe because you can always ephemerate your charming prince to charm whatever creature they oh, choose. That's true. Yeah. So that way, if you like dubious challenge and you don't see what you need, well, it's like, oh, I guess I'll take this Arbor Elf and you get Emrakul, but I'll flicker my charming prince and get it back. Right. Anyway. <laughs> or you could do something like dubious. Like if you have a prince and an ephemerate, a prince in play of an ephemerate in your hand and you dubious challenge and you reveal like Imrakul and Iona, you can exile them both. It doesn't matter what they choose and you charm back the other one. That's good. So, okay. I hadn't seen ephemerate like that until we talked it out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I guess four smugglers copter to dig, put some pressure, add some power to the board for right. Mosswort. And you can always throw Imrakul away and shuffle your graveyard back in. Yeah, so true. Blade Splicer can crew it. Yeah. So this deck is a little bit uh uh a little bit budget because he's running Avacyn's Pilgrim instead of uh, Noble Hierarch. Yeah, and but only four fetch lands plus Temple Gardens. Yeah, I do think that. I mean, it's you know, a little. I guess four Emrakul is is where the the cost is at. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I like. I don't know, but it was interesting to to see that little uh, thing. It's probably but... the cheapest deck we've talked about so far. So. <laughs> Welcome to modern. <laughs> But uh, yeah, for the memes alone, good job, KF Chicken. Love your <laughs> dubious challenge deck. If I would be playing it. So Drown in the Lock is a card from Throne of Eldraine that I was pretty hyped on. And uh, we talked about it briefly in part of the episode that got lost. But so Drown in the Lock costs a blue and a black for an instant that says... Choose one. Counter target spell with a converted mana cost less than or equal to the number of cards in its controller's graveyard, or destroy target creature with a converted mana cost less than or equal to the number of cards in its controller's graveyard. Michael, how many how many cards tend to end up in a person's graveyard in modern by turn two? Uh, quite a few. You've got like fetch lands and serum visions or lightning bolts or something. I mean, there's like a good number of stuff that's going to end up excuse me in your graveyard. And converted mana costs of things and tend to be small too. So even if your opponent is like turn one, forest noble hierarch, like it really only takes two, you kill the noble hierarch, now they have one, and then if they like fetch the next turn, now you count another two drop, right? Like you're not playing anything that costs more than three or four most of the time. So it doesn't take long for this to just counter or destroy anything. Right, which is really, really crazy. Like this card only costs two mana. It's now probably the closest version of 
straight counter spell that we have in modern. Now, granted, it requires you to be in two colors. Yeah, it's tricky, though, because it does ask for your opponent's graveyard. So, like, in the scenario where your opponent goes Forest Noble Hierarch or Ancient Ziggurat Noble Hierarch or something, and you have this in your hand, it might be a while till it does something, especially if, like, it becomes a known quantity to the point where people are playing around it. Or yeah. post-board, you know, maybe your opponent's playing Rest in Peace or something. Or Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it, it's a little bit situational, so I don't know. I'd say it's the closest thing to counterspell, but in a lot of matchups, I think it is counterspell. Yeah. I was actually in the lost episode. I was actually higher on this than Alex was. Alex yeah. didn't like it. Um, yeah. If I recall correctly, Alex might come in and correct me or something. But um. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think he he was sort of like medium on it. Uh, one thing that I think is interesting about this Dran on the Lock card is it's showing up in my favorite. I can't believe this is viable in modern, but apparently it is decks which are Niv to Light. <laughs> The decks that use Bring to Light and Niv Mizzet Reborn uh, to just outvalue your opponent. So, yeah, which we did see one of those in the top 32 of the challenge, so it is definitely a legitimate deck. It wasn't playing any Eldrain cards. It, it uh, you know, decided not to play John on the Lock. The yeah. one, the one from the challenge, which which is what I looked at. But. Right. So there, a a list that I saw that is playing it was a five zero from Rodebo. Uh, so this was so Niv Misery Born, remember, is a five co- it costs Wooberg for a six six flying dragon. Already pretty good. Yep. Uh, and when it enters the battlefield, you reveal the top ten cards of your deck, and you may choose any number of cards, one from each, essentially each guild of Ravnica. So two color cards that are different color pairs and put them into your hand. So Magical Christmas Land, Niv Mizzet draws you uh, ten cards. Wow. But that almost never happens. <laughs> but in a deck built for it. Drawing five to six cards is not unheard of, yeah. and turns out getting a five mana six six flyer that draws you six cards is really good. Yeah, and, and it, even drawing just three cards can be backbreaking. Yeah, and it dodges a lot of the removal in modern. I mean, it it's got enough toughness to never get killed by lightning bolt or anything. I mean, I guess light bolt snap bolt kills it, but it it doesn't die to fatal push even with revolt. I mean, it it dodges a lot of the removal that you see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it can't be dismembered. So part of the thing that was exciting is um, the Demir cards have not always been the most exciting. Like when you're building your Niv to Light, oh, it's called Niv to Light because you also run Bring to Light as more Niv Mizzets. Makes sense. Um, and so the Demir cards tend to be sort of weak, but you want to kind of run a few of every guilds to maximize your chances of drawing them and drown in the lock. Cause you have to have different guilds. So if you like overload on like, you know, you decide Rakdos cards are the best and you're playing like four Terminate and four Dreadbore or something or four Blightning, I don't know. And then, but if you see two Terminate and a Dreadbore in those 10 cards, you only take one of them, right? So you right. want to have like a diversity of different guilds in your deck to make sure you maximize the number of cards you can draw. Yeah. And so, like, this list from Rotobo, like, as an example, uh, it's running, uh, like, one Oko Thief of Crowns, two of the three Drop Teferi, three Red Insects. Those are all different guilds. Uh, it has one Huntmaster of the Fells, one Knight of Autumn, one Tulsimir Friends of Wolves. I like the Tulsimir and Hunter of the Fells uh, yeah. synergy oh, going on there. Going. I like that it makes Tulsimir Friend of Wolves modern viable. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess, like, there's enough things that make wolves and, like, the card is enough value that maybe it's, like, a fringy top-of-the-curve Celestia guy. I never thought of it that way until I saw this, but it's starting to show up in Standard, too, because of, like, it's whenever any wolf enters the battlefield, uh, you gain three life and it fights target creature. Yeah. It may, you may have it fight target creature, I think. I think it's it you up? may, Yeah. Yeah. So it comes in, it's a 3-3, makes a 3-3 that immediately gains you three life and fights. So it's like kind of, it reminds me of Huntmaster, costs yeah. an extra mana, but like ha- comes with a lot of value. And if you can get like one more trigger off it, I feel like that's where it really starts to go crazy. And so in standard, there's like enough good wolves in standard now that like Garrick makes wolves and there's Wicked Wolf and there's Night Pack Howler, which like makes a wolf every turn and also pumps all your wolves. Ambusher. Ambusher, Night Pack Ambusher. Maybe yeah. Cowler is probably a card from Dark Ascension or something. I don't. Know, I think but. so. <laughs> I think I think it transforms. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Night Pack Ambusher. Yeah. Uh, so it's like Tulsimir is starting to see play in Standard where it didn't pre rotation. So maybe maybe it just needs the right cards to be a thing in Modern. Yeah. Yeah. Like Huntmaster. 
Um, uh, like Niv Mizzet, and you need Selesnia cards in your deck. <laughs> right, right. And like, it's funny because like the Selesnia cards, like they'll run like Safe Right Quest, which you can play in either green or white to sort of fix your mana. And a lot of these I decks. Guess, I guess what Tulsimir is doing here is I think that you just want a little bit of life gain in your deck. And like, this is a card that is basically Celestia Thrag Tusk. Like, normally you want to play Thrag oh, Tusk. Yeah. Because it gains you a little bit more life. It has more. It doesn't have more power, I guess, but it, it gains you more life. And so, like, if you want that effect, you just play Thrag Tusk. And the fight, it kind of can somewhat make up for the power also. Right. Well, you ha- you get six power out of your Tulsimir, right? It's just not. Totally. Yeah. As eight opposed to the total eight. from Thrag Tusk, yeah. but across some stuff has to happen. But yeah, I mean. And they Normally, both have the punishment for bouncing. Yeah. yeah. You you both want to play... You want to play um, Thrag Tusk. Most of the time, it's easier to cast. It gains you more life up front. But this is like a card that has a guild that Niv can pick up that does a Thrag Tusk impression. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And a, a lot of this deck is uh, uh, powered by both Pillar of the Pay Runes, which is essentially a painless City of Brass in a deck that's only running gold cards, uh, and the Arkham's Astrolabe Snow Mana Base. Um, and uh, wow, five, five Color Snow sounds like something that would be so atrocious like a year ago. And here we are with Arkham's Astrolabe, and it's like, yeah, yeah, you just have the Five Color Snow Mana Base, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so funny because like Astrolabe is such an elegant card that... All you have to do is find one of them, and now your mana base feels really good. And any yeah. additional ones you find just make your mana base even smoother, and they never cost you a card. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people saying that like Arkham's Astrolabe is one of Modern Horizons' big sins because it like makes mana bases too good, mostly in Popper, but also in in Modern and maybe even older formats. And the fact that it's a one mana artifact that like the Urza decks can take advantage of, or like other artifact shenanigans decks that generally nobody wants to play against. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and the, the yeah the combination of Astrolabe and Prismatic Vista really yeah. cemented the ability to play these like hodgepodge snow based mana bases. And yeah, and so now we have five color Niv Miseryborn, which I don't know what sort of testing for modern the future future league ever considers, but I I highly doubt they ever thought, oh, bring to the light plus Niv Miz, it's going to be a thing in modern. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that they were pleasantly surprised. But yeah, so this deck is playing one Drown in the Lock as a as a Demir card alongside right. the other Demir card of one unmoored ego, which sometimes just wins matches out of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, and now it's running one, this one's running one thought erasure, which I thought was kind of a good, a good oh, pull like from, from last bad. year. Um, you know, the, that reminds me. So, so thought erasure is kind of like, uh, it does a good thought sees impersonation. Um, yeah. And when you were mentioning Peak a while back, so Peak is one of those cards that I'm excited to see see more play in Modern because it's always one of those cards that I'm surprised doesn't see more play in Modern because uh, it's the best rate you can get for cycling through a card and it gives you a ton of information, which I feel like a lot of people, like part of the value of Thoughtseize is obviously preemptively getting rid of a threat, but it also then gives you semi-perfect information for much of the rest of the next you know, the next several turns, yeah, you have semi-perfect information. Um, a turn one thought seize can give you like a perfect game plan for the next two, three turns. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so Peak historically got played uh, in Splinter Twin. Like when Gitaxian Probe was legal, you played Peak over Gitaxian Probe because you wanted to know if the coast was clear, but you also wanted to play at instant speed. You wanted to pass with open mana on turn one to maybe spell snare or lightning bolt. You wanted to pass with open mana on turn two to maybe remand or mana leak or something. You wanted to pass spell with open mana. Spell pierce. Right. Not spell, spell snare. No snare. I don't think you were playing pierce. Well, spell snare is point. always a two cost thing. Well, if you're on the draw. So oh, gotcha. I mean, okay. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you, so you want to pass with open mana every turn. And like, I guess probe is like a sorcery that you, you know, can pay some life for. But yeah, I mean, they were playing peak um, as like an instant speed card that didn't cost you any life. Uh, you could see if the coast was clear to go for your combo. It's like an okay snapcaster target where like on their end step, if they don't do anything, you can just snapcaster peak to like cycle through cards, find your combo. Um, so yeah, peak has gotten played. Um in these like decks that want to play at instant speed. And that is basically what twin is now. You're playing mostly at instant speed. You have Kiki Jiki in your deck as like a pester my Kiki Jiki. So you can like peek to see if the coast is clear, but also it like triggers your Briarhorn cutthroat and it, you know, cycles through cards to find your Brian Kiki Born. Jiki. Brian Born. 
Briarhorn. Briarhorn's a card, right? Isn't Briarhorn that, like, is a elemental Flash that like Flash giant growths. Brian Bourne. Dang, I'm Alex Kesslering so bad. He can't. <laughs> he can't ever hear this episode. We have to make sure he doesn't listen. There's to no it. way he's going to listen to this episode. Okay, good. The man's too busy. All right, good. So, uh, yeah, Brian Bourne. I got to get that right before I'm on with Alex again because he'll call me out. Um, okay. No, so he won't. Brian he'll 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 start saying Briarhorn cutthroat, and he's like, "Is that the is that the Minotaur that does damage when you s- discard cards?" Briar yeah. Briarhorn. Um, Brian, it triggers your Brianborn cutthroat. It's like an okay Snapcaster target if you don't have an opt in your yard. It like does st- it cycles through cards. It does stuff. It's like a good fifth or sixth or seventh uh opt basically yeah yeah it's interesting that's in this push pull place with opt because obviously scry one is powerful and when you're like it's interesting because it's like both of them are good in a combo deck opt is good because you're digging towards your combo pieces and peak is good for when you're ready to go to make sure you're safe um so it's cool to see them showing up more and so i was just thinking about how peak and thought sees or like peak and uh like Inquisition fit in the same place where they both are sort of card neutral. You're giving up a card for them to give up a card. In peak, you're just not giving up a card. And in both times, you get information about your opponent's hands. Yeah. Uh, Drown the Lock is also showing up in a cool uh, mill deck. So mill, I feel, has always been like tier two, but always making like surprise showings in various modern yeah, tournaments. Well, it's interesting. In limited... Um, the blue black archetype in Eldrain is like mill, but it's not necessarily mill your opponent's entire deck. It's like mill them until they have a certain number of cards in graveyard, and then you turn on your drown in the lock and you turn on your um. There's like a draw spell that like gets cheaper if they have uh, cards into in the graveyard. story, which saw which is now seeing some modern play. Yeah, Ooh, that's cool. So um, and then yeah, Vantress Gargoyle like attacks if they have more cards in graveyard. There's like cards that count your opponent's graveyard and like do something based on how many cards they have. Yeah. So into the story is a card that I was excited to see show up in modern. It's been shown up in some Grixis flash decks. Um, so into the story is a, yeah, I think I have it. I kind of want to look at it on your screen. Yeah, here it is. So, so this Grixis flash deck by aspiring spike went a five Oh, um, and the deck, uh, plays two of into the story. So into the story costs five, uh, and five blue, blue for an instant draw four cards. It's an instant. Yeah. Wow. I thought that card was a sorcery. I had it in one of my sealed pools, but yep. I wasn't playing blue. So oh, yeah. So pay attention to it. <laughs> so it's a seven mana instant draw four, but it has the text. If your opponent has seven or more cards in their graveyard, it costs three less. So nice. then it becomes a four mana draw four instant speed. And That's uh, pretty strong. the card opportunity has seen play and constructed levels of magic before. It hasn't really broken through in modern because you just don't really want to be spending six mana. By the time you're paying paying six, you can just be playing Sphinx's Revelation or something else and get a little bit more value, a little bit more flexibility. Right. But in a... It, it's interesting because, like, this card came out. There are... Because so much of modern, even with the banning of Faithless Looting, is still a pretty graveyard-intensive format, by time you want to be able to cast this to refill your hand, your opponent might have seven cards in their graveyard, in which case, for the four mana, the amount that you would play for, like, a factor fiction, you can just get a 4-0 pile that your opponent doesn't get to see. Right, and so what I was saying about Drown in the Lock, like, not always doing what you want because maybe your opponent, like, just isn't putting cards in their graveyard because they're, like, a deck like Humans or a deck like Collected Company decks where they just, like, play to the board and they have very few instants of sorceries and sometimes they don't even bother with fetch lands because, like, they have a different thing going on with their mana base, like Unclaimed Territories or, you know, Mana Dorks or whatever. Um, but an interactive deck like this is just going to put cards in your opponent's graveyard. You're going to be countering their spells with, you know, uh, the You got cryptics and, and your, yeah, Force of Negation. You're lightning bolting their creatures. Well, your, Force of Negation exiles. I almost said Force of Negation, but... <laughs> yeah, well, you've got Kolagon's Command, which can sometimes put two cards in their yeah. graveyard. And uh, then you have Thought Scours in your deck, which you're playing Tassigers in this deck and Torrential Gear Hulk and Snapcaster. So generally, you want to Thought Scour yourself. But if you have an End of the Story in hand and you just count your opponent's graveyard, you can just like, well, yeah, I'll Thought Scour you. <laughs> right. And also because you're playing Drown in the Locks, 
turn one thought scour your opponent now my drown of the locks are that's counter true spell. actually maybe because you're playing four drown in the lock and two into the story in this deck you're just thought scour your opponent more often than not yeah because i feel like at, at least to get it started like what because because yeah. you're drowning the locks since most spells in modern cost three or less most of the relevant ones cost three or less and then the four cost ones start really like breaking the the thing so if you can get three cards into your opponent's graveyard which thought scour plus them cracking one fetch now your drowning locks are going to be countering yeah, a lot of the spicy you can, cards you can like just turn one thought scour them on their end step holding up spell snare lightning bolt fatal push whatever you need to be holding up and then turn two you can uh just hold up drown in the lock and counter yeah. their two drop or even their three drop if you're on the draw and they you know cracked fetch or played a serum visions or something i mean that's thought scour into drown in the lock i think is real and yeah and it's going to be showing up. I like. I think Grixis Control is maybe the best home for it, but it really is only two colors. You could be that could be showing up in like an Esper deck or in like you know just a blue black deck. Yeah. So when it shows up in this blue black um, mill 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 deck, oh, I guess this one isn't playing Thought Scour. That seems kind of funny. Yeah, it's but, not like the best bang for your buck if you're trying to mill their whole deck. But. Um, the one interesting thing about this deck is this feels like a deck that I would want to experiment around with Kess in. Um, the Grixis control? Yeah, like almost... Uh, I've never played much with Tassiger, so I it's hard for me to like rate how valuable... I mean, obviously being able to just spend mana you weren't going to spend to draw yourself cards seems good. And the fact that you can cast Tassiger for like two mana or whatever seems real good. Yeah, it's like one or two mana. You can hold up mana to like counter more spells, right? That's the yeah. idea. But I feel like with aspiring spikes list I would want to maybe try those two Tasker's as two Kess and just see whether... Like see how they play differently because yeah. the amount of cheap valuable one for ones and two for ones in the instant slot like you got 28 like doing stuff instance well so what's interesting is like kess tends to be better if you're playing a discard suite as your main disruption rather than counter spells and this deck is playing counter spells as its main disruption suite oh, okay but what's interesting is because kess only casts on your own turn so right. if you like thought seize on turn one when you play kess on turn five you can then thought seize again whereas if you spell snare on turn one you play kess on turn four five that spell snare isn't really doing anything for you but what's interesting about drown in the lock is like it's good as an instant speed counter spell that plays at instant speed, but it's fine at sorcery speed because it's also removal, which right. is a really interesting way to build your counter speed suite to like be friendly towards sorcery speed cards. Right. We were talking about how drown in the lock theoretically, if there was some sort of uh, deck that used the cascade mechanic or the free spell mechanic. Yeah. Fires of invention uh, or something yeah. like fire of invention is the niv mizzet deck in standard where you like play the fires of invention lets you cast uh, two cards without paying their mana cost on your turn. As long as their mana cost is equal to or less than the number of lands you control. Right, and then you cannot play spells in your opponent's turn. So you are, like, niv visiting there. You're, like, drawing a bunch of big, expensive Planeswalker idiots. You're like, here's Garrick for free. I did it. Like, um, so in a world where you're, like, doing something like that in modern, Drown in the Lock allows you to, like, counter spells early in the game or, like, protect your fires if you have enough mana, but then also is fine if you just have to cast it at sorcery speed. So it, like, allows you to play a counter spell that synergy synergizes with sorcery speed cards. Like, Jace Vryn's Prodigy is another one that springs to mind. Oh, yeah. Where, like, Jace Vryn's Prodigy flashes something back at sorcery speed. So you can, like, use this as a counter spell in your Jace Vryn's Prodigy deck and then flash it back as a removal spell later, which I think is, like, sounds really strong to me. And Thought Scour is a Jace Vryn's Prodigy card, too. So I think yeah, it, those cards seem like a match made in heaven to me as well. Right. It feels like you could maybe take this basic, uh, this sort of deck skeleton that, aspiring spike he has here and shift the uh the counterspell suite towards more the proactive discard suite and try uh cast but otherwise a lot of the value cards like the drowns the fatal pushes the into the stories colon's command all those still feel like like you're saying you, you just change aggressive uh discard in for a lot of the counter spells but then you can still keep drown in the lock so that you're still playing counter spells you can still counter that Oh, I need to counter this Titan Urza or, or something. Urza yeah. or whatever. Uh, it's funny how like you have to counter the Titan or the Urza. Just killing it is yeah, usually not, not enough. Not even close to <laughs> enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a cool list. The uh, mill deck that I was talking about initially. Uh, so 
this one uh, gets to use both Drown in the Lock and the new Vantress Gargoyle, like you were talking about. I like Vantress Gargoyle in the deck like this. Yeah, so Vantress Gargoyle is acting a little bit like Jace's Jace's Phantasm. Which they're also playing for of. Which they're also (laughs) playing for of. Um, And so this deck is running four Hedron Crab, four Jace's Phantasm. Jace's Phantasm, by the way, it's a one drop, will cost one blue, one one flyer, that if your opponent has... Ten or more cards in their graveyard, uh, uh, it gets plus four, plus four. Uh, And then uh, Manic Scribe, which is when it enters the battlefield, mill somebody for three, and then it has Delirium at the beginning of each player's turn, upkeep, if you have Delirium, mill three. Okay. That's an interesting choice. I feel like that card isn't super strong. So when it enters the battlefield, yeah. In the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, if they're if you have delirium at the top three, I guess it's three cards every turn. And yeah, it's like hard to get a better rate than that. So it's a little bit like a hedron crab, uh, and then Vantress gargoyle, like you mentioned. The cool thing about Vantress gargoyle is it's a fine defender until you've turned on, right? Because it can it 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 can block as long as you have four or more cards in your hand, which you're playing a control deck, so you will always have four or more cards right. in your hand. And then it can attack once your opponent has seven or more cards in their graveyard. And then the cool part is it's just a two-mana 5-4 flyer, so it's an excellent blocker. It can block phoenixes and uh, like all sorts of like prowess red creatures. Yeah. All day. Like, how, like how much they have to prowess, like they have to combine both a lightning bolt and sacrificing there. Yeah. It's yeah. going to two for one a lot of people. It is an artifact, which makes it easy to destroy. However, it, it also, like, now it's an artifact for your Manic Scribe, right? Like, you play Vantress Guard on turn three or turn two, and then they kill it, and you're like, Manic Scribe, but now I have, you know, um, Prowess because I've already played an Archive Trap and Cracked Fetch and whatever, right? Like, Right, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, the deck's got Archive Trap. It's got two Crypt Incursion, which I really like. Like, Crypt yeah, Incursion is so that's... gas against Dredge. So grass against the Hedron Crab Vine, which is kind of morphed out of the death of Hogak. Yeah. Um, and then it's got so Drown the Lock, with Fatal the Potion. Four Phantasm and two Gargoyle. It it looks more like this deck has a plan to just kill you. Uh, and if you get milled out before then, cool. <laughs> yeah, it's got it's got four glimpse and four archive traps. So it, yeah, it's cool that it sometimes you draw an opening hand, you're like, oh, it's got a glimpse and a trap. Like I'm definitely gonna get there. But sometimes you'll draw an opening hand that has like a phantasm and a gargoyle or two phantasms, and you're like, oh, I'm just gonna beat you to death yeah, once I've got one. Jace's phantasm. Oh, you fetched an archive trap. Uh, turn two <laughs> gargoyle. Like you're you're just they're much bigger than like anything your opponent. Is, your opponent is like, oh, I don't know, girl mag angler uh, like <laughs> and, and what's cool is like that ability then allows you uh to use your sideboard the sideboard here has like four ley line of sanctity two plague engineer four surgical extraction two hercules recall a knight of souls betrayal which is kind of a fun card uh instead of drift and chris incursion but it's cool that i imagine sometimes if you realize oh my opponent's just going to be able to beat my creature beat down you can essentially side out your creature beatdown plan and side into a more heavy mill control yeah. deck, which I think is a yeah. Cool. And then it has like the classic mill package for archive trap, four glimpse, three mesmeric orb, uh, and then visions of beyond. Um, and I'll tell you what, field of ruin has gone such a long way towards making um, these mill strategies better because I mean you could always run ghost quarter you can always ghost quarter them and then archive trap them haha gotcha but field of ruin making it so you don't have to lose out on lands uh is just so big yeah totally yeah so yeah it's a cool deck and i like vantress gargoyle vantress gargoyle we didn't mention also tap uh each player mills one card which is relevant in like if you're a mill light game vantress gargoyle can turn on itself uh also turn on your drown in the lock and uh, turn on your manic scribe and turn on your manic scribe yeah, because yeah, it mills cards from your deck, too. So Vantress Gargoyle Manic Scribe seems like a match made in heaven. Um, I guess Manic Scribe also sometimes, like, eats removal that, like, allows, clears the way for your Phantasm or your Gargoyle later on or something. Did we see what its power like, and toughness is? Once you're already playing creatures, it's, a, it's an 0-3. Oh, okay. Well, that's not bad, too. Like, yeah, it blocks some stuff. Like, knowing that they will have to waste a kill spell or else their Goblin Guide can't get through it, you know, doesn't seem irrelevant. Yeah. So. It's two mana, so it's like a two mana O three is like, meh, but yeah, but you're not playing on beating down. No, well, not well, with Manic Scribe. Not with Manic Scribe. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, I mean, the the gargoyle, it, it it's cool. Like there were times, and my only experience playing against so far is limited. But but in limited, where like my opponent would just play it on turn three, and I just can't attack with my two drop. I can't attack with my three drop. I play a four drop. I'm like, well, do I want to trade with their two drop? And they're just like getting ahead the whole time. They're like doing other stuff, playing creatures, and I just cannot pressure their life total at all for only two mana. Yeah, and then eventually it turns on and just beats me up if I don't get rid of it. Like it just demands removal, or it just like changes the entire game. And I think that's honestly true in modern. Like if you end up trading this for like a Tarmogoy for something, sometimes that's fine. You mill them out; they die. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's such a good rate at two mana. I'm yeah. still sort of dumbfounded by the fact that uh, it can still block. Yeah, if you have uh-huh. four more cards in hand, which is like you play it on turn two, how many? cards you can have in hand probably a lot <laughs> yeah even if you're on the play turn two after going land then land vantress gargoyle you still have five or six cards in your hand yeah so five you have five you have cards five. in your hand so, so you could have played like a fatal push on turn one to get rid of their noble hierarch and then play vantress gargoyle on turn two you still have four cards in hand. you can still block <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and the card is the deck is playing uh visions of beyond so the mill you know turns out if you're playing mill you do get to play ancestral recall yeah. uh and it plays shell dock isle which is you yeah. know a, these hideaway lands they're yeah, still they're sh- seeing they're showing up showing up um two lists that i wanted to talk about just because i like them so much and yep, I'm, i have one of those too so i'll we'll do yours first oh sure okay so one of them is uh i love a bant soul herder this is like a deck that was initially uh star like uh, like gabriel and the Seaf like brought it to a lot of people's attention by streaming it and it's just bant enter the battlefield value well, I know you've always wanted there to be a modern deck where Coiling Oracle is playable. So oh, this is it's... this is it for you. Yeah, Coiling Oracle. It, both Coiling, Coiling Oracle, Oracle is like Ben is like Marshall's Mere Superion. I do, I mean I love Coiling Oracle. Like it's it's got so much value. I love Risen Reef for the Snake same Elf Druid. Can't go wrong with that. Uh-huh. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it seems like you could have about a million creature types because it's also like a mutant and stuff. Yeah, yeah. but uh, so Coiling Oracle, which is the uh, Costs a green and blue for a 1-1. One, one. When it enters the battlefield, you reveal the top card of your deck. If it's a land, put it onto the battlefield. If it's not a land, put it in your hand. So it's all the great tastes of all the two-drop draw card guys, but also with the chance of ramping you. Um, so this deck runs four Coiling Oracle and also four Ice Fang Coatl, who does a decent Coiling Oracle impersonation while being flashy, flying, and sometimes death touchy. Yeah, definitely easier to two-for-one your opponent with the Ice Fang because you can draw a card immediately and then block something at instant speed and just like instant two-for-one for two mana, which, as we've discussed in the cast before when evaluating new cards, like the potential at a two-for-one for only two mana is very strong. Yeah, and even if you're not two-for-one-ing, the fact that it's a free card when you flash it into your opponent's turn and just draw a card, and now I have a 1-1 one, one flyer that will eventually have Death Touch mm. that didn't cost me a card, and because it had Flash... Ultimate, and it can yeah, chip yeah. in for damage to their head, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of decks playing the Coatl in their Stoneforge packages because it carries a sword really well. Um, but uh, so these, these Soul Herder decks... Their, their principal card, Soul Herder, which blinks. So you're getting extra triggers of these card draw creatures. You're getting extra triggers of Reflector Mage and uh, Knight of Autumn. And uh, like like this build has like Watcher for Tomorrows, which is another card we're really excited about. Speaking of hard, hideaway cards. So, hideaway. Uh, and this one's running Collected Company. Um, and then it has a few Ephemerates because it turns out Ephemerate plus Eternal Witness is infinite. So I card advantage. I think um, Gabe Nassif was not typically playing collected company, was he? No. List? So this is this is a this is a five zero build from Lindsay Wa- Lindsay Waker uh, that uh, so it took the basic Gabriel Nassif shell. Um, it's a lot of these builds are now running time warps because it turns out it's really easy for you to set up time warp plus Eternal Witness and Soul Herder to take infinite turns. Or, or Ephemerate. Or Ephemerate yeah, with yeah. Uh, Eternal Witness and Time Warp to take infinite turns. So uh, Ephemerate showing itself to be extremely powerful. I like that this this deck is a deck that revels in all the cute cards from Modern Horizons. That It's like a big pile of great Modern Horizons cards. Nice uh, uncommon payoff card for limited. Oh, wait, four of in a modern deck. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Plus, it's, you know, it's Soul Herder, so it's got Seb Kim McKinnon's beautiful art on it the whole time. It makes sense. I mean, so Gabe Nassif, I, I think, is partial to, like, Jace the Mind Sculptor and control cards because he's historically been like a blue white control player but so yeah i he usually plays planeswalkers in that collected company spot but it really does make sense to put collected company there because you're playing tons of like two and three mana just like value creatures where you can just like you know collected company into soul herder eternal witness get back collected company and just like you can just you know it seems like it fits perfectly in the deck and i'm sure gabe nasif tried it at some point on his stream but when i've seen him play it he's usually not playing it so he decided it wasn't for him but it definitely seems like a card that fits perfectly into the deck right yeah, I really like Gabe Nassif, like where his brain goes in in brews. He's just a big fan of like like strong, incremental, resilient value. Uh, I love his Soul Tide Ninjas build. Like I personally immediately built that. Um, and again, it plays Ice Fang Waddle, but then it, it has a lot of value through like Ingenious Infiltrator and Fallen Shinobi and stuff like that. So I I love. I, I love creatures who draw cards when they enter the battlefield. I love car- creatures who draw you cards when they hit your opponent. So drawing yeah, cards. And I, I think a lot <laughs> of these like uh, blue creature decks are like been subtly enabled by force and negation, like countering, you know, removal spells on your creatures. It makes it a little bit safer to like spend a lot of mana on a creature. I mean, obviously your opponent can still kill it on your turn because force and negation doesn't protect it. But like, you know, the fact that if your opponent is tapped out, you can sneak in a fallen shinobi and like maybe even on top with it because you can force their their removal spell or whatever um yeah is cool um so okay speaking of like a bant creature deck i have one of those let me let me find my my bant deck that i found so i screenshotted this because it's playing oko and we're trying to talk about l green cards i think uh, oko has like been dominating standard um for those who haven't heard a lot of uh, complaints about it just like ignoring the text on your opponent's cards uh, and sometimes gaining you a ton of life and yeah, just having just so much really loyalty <laughs> plus i i think uh, you know the turn one gilded goose turn two oko is one of the strongest yeah, standard like openings nearly unbeatable yeah. i mean you just you can gain a ton of life if your opponent is pressuring your life if your opponent is attacking oko you're still effectively gaining a ton of life i mean it just like makes it really hard for your opponent you can turn their stuff into three threes if they're playing big great henge decks or whatever or you could just steal their great henge give it enough loyalty i mean one plus if you go turn two oko plus you can steal anything your opponent plays because they probably aren't able to pressure it and you just like yeah it's a really irritating card and it's made the crossover into modern so this is um another collected company bant deck uh, but it's not relying on Soul Herder value. It's a little bit more uh, a beat down, and it's playing Stoneforge Mystic. So it's got two Oko Thief of Crowns, one Teferi Time Raveler, three Deputy of Detention, uh, which the Soul Herder deck was playing one of because it's like a great collected company creature, um, two Giver of Runes, one Hex Drinker, four Ice Fang Kotal, four Noble Hierarch, two Ranger Captain of Eos, uh, which is the Modern Horizon card that searches for a one drop. Um, you can search for your Giver of Runes or your Hex Drinker or your Hierarch. Three Spell Queller, three Stoneforge Mystic, four Company, four Exile, uh, Pat's Exile, one Batter Skull, one Sword of Feast Famine, one Sword of Fire and Ice. Um, so it's just like a Bant mid-range deck playing uh, Oko and Teferi and then like a Collected Company, Stoneforge, pretty standard stuff. But I think it's cool that decks like this are able to be successful. This one is not leaning on Force of Negation, although... That's just because I think it just doesn't have enough blue creatures. But it's got Spell Quellers with Teferi, um, which is like a cute little combo. Looks like there's only one Teferi. I would guess that this player probably started with more Teferis because it seems like it would be great in this type of deck and then just kind of cut them down because it wasn't good enough. Or replace Teferis with Oko to try Oko out. Um, I feel like as a starting point for this deck, I would have started with more Teferis because he's like obviously a powerful card and has great synergy with Spell Queller because you like exile their spell and then if they kill spell queller they can't cast their spell because the fairy prevents them um, unless they i guess if they kill spell queller during their main phase no because it, it tries to cast it during um during the resolution of a trigger a triggered ability oh really wow yeah, so it won't Teferi's really irritating. Why, why? They really should have reversed teferi's static text and it's plus one yeah so i think uh <laughs> I think that Teferi and Oko both being like really strong two mana planeswalkers that you can cast off of a noble hierarch on turn two is great in modern. And I, you know, said as much when we were talking about Oko. And a few times I've talked about how I think Teferi is underplayed in both decks like this and also like combo decks like Ad Nauseam or Urza, which mm. it shows up occasionally in those decks now. But I think that like, 
I think Teferi has a lot of potential in modern, and I think that this is the type of shell where he has potential, and also the type of shell where I think Oko has potential, because they both kind of do similar things. Teferi focuses more if your opponent is reactive, because it prevents them from playing stuff on your turn, and it allows you to, like, you can play stuff on their turn and, like, just kind of irritate a reactive player. And Oko, I think, is better if your opponent is proactive, because it, like, steals their permanence, it gains you a ton of life, it, like you know, turns their Urza into a 3-3, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that this is a really cool deck. Yeah, uh, yeah, and the fact that both of Oko's abilities are positive abilities, too, yeah. so you're neutralizing threats while also making Oko harder to remove, Yeah, uh, is, is a, yeah, really strong. I wonder, and we've seen now a few Oko with Gilded Goose in Modern, like, that the well, yeah, goose, so, the so. goose isn't, you know, the goose is as good as a Birds of Paradise, uh, you know, as for that first turn. And because if you have any way to keep making food, then it stays as good as Birds of Paradise, which was, which is obviously a strong modern card. Yeah. So like when we were talking about the comparison between goose and hierarch um, on the show, I, I think like hierarch is better in most of the decks that already exist because you want that mana to like keep going. It allows you to like maybe shave lands because you can afford to miss a land drop to, you know, because Noble Hierarch consistently makes mana or you can like curve soul hoarder, soul herder into collected company or into time warp or, or like, you know, you want that mana consistently over time. And like a lot of decks that are playing mana dorks are relying on that mana every turn. What Goose is good for doing is, like, in a long game where, like, now your Noble Hierarch's no longer relevant, it, like, can continue to produce value and just, like, put you out of range of a lot of decks, like, by gaining life right. every turn, basically. Yeah, because at the bare minimum, it's four, four mana gain three life every turn. Now, it's not great rate, but it's something, and it's four mana that you can amortize over multiple turns, Right, too. like, if you have kind of come to parity against burn like you stabilize by like killing off their creatures or you have a creature and they have like a goblin guy then they can't break through or whatever but you can't attack because you don't want to die to like bolt your creature attack you level spike or something so you're both just kind of sitting there if you're gaining four life every turn then you're winning and golden and the goose does it at instant speed too so you can like be holding up counters or collected company path whatever and then if you just like feel like you need the life more you can like end step make a food crack it or even you know over the course of two turns does the food remain a food when oko elks it no it loses all abilities uh it will have the food type but it won't have the ability so that's kind of interesting that if you have a goose and an oko actually i think he might replace creature types let's look up oko well food's an artifact type not a creature type oh you're right so so i wonder if it becomes an artifact creature elk food Yum, yum. <laughs> so Oko Thief. Wait, it says here, Oko's second ability overrides all colors and creature types the affected creature right. has. It's it just a green elk. Types. The creature keeps any super types, such as legendary, but loses any other card types it has, such as artifact. Okay, oh, okay. so strike so what I just said. it will no longer said. be an artifact, and it will no longer be a food by extension. Okay, okay. Well, well still good. That's fine. Still, yeah. I mean, still, it's nothing to sneeze at that if you don't need to, if you don't need that mana and you actually have excess mana, then two mana tap goose, make a 3-3 three, three elk is something those two can do together, which is not the worst. Yeah, or make a food, like maybe your earlier Oko food is gone for some reason, you ate it or fed it to your goose, you can like make a food and trade it to them for something good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Oko does a lot. I think uh, I think he's got a future in modern, especially having seen him actually played um, in standard. I feel like turn two Oko is so powerful and standard and you can do it so much more consistently in modern. It's definitely worth uh, thinking about. Yeah. And even the, uh, the Royal Scions I saw showed up in a breach deck as people were expecting. Cool. that. I kind of expected it to be like maybe in a Phoenixy type blue red graveyard thing. I didn't, Breach is cool, though. It is interesting that the banning of Faithless Looting has made Is It Phoenix completely drop out of the That's modern list. So it I, I seems like it, maybe that, like, maybe in the future there's some way for it to come back with something like yeah, Thought I mean, Scour well, that it wasn't well, playing previously. And Haggle. Alex is a big proponent of Haggle and uh, Royal Scions. I mean, I think the deck gets slower for sure, no matter what. But I don't know. I mean, I think that, that we could see Phoenix, Rise of Phoenix, Rise from the Ashes. <laughs> rise from the Ashes. Um, we, it, you know, it just, somebody has to figure out the right build to kind of get some momentum going. Well, we've been recording for a while, so yep. maybe we'll uh, do the... A lot of the... cool Eldraine stuff happening in modern. Yeah, so thanks oh, for... I didn't even get to talk about my... Uh, well, 
Oh, well, it, next yeah, time, next time. No, we can talk about it real quick. The bajuka bog. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so this a, is a cool thing. There's yeah. a tweet from Sam Black that I saw. Uh, Sam Black is one of my favorite pro players. Um, and I, he was talking about how, especially with, you know, he was writing an article about Once Upon a Time and he was talking about it in the context of modern. Um, and one of the decks that people are excited about Once Upon a Time for is Amulet Titan because it helps you find your like Sakura Tribe Scout or Azusa or find your um, growth chamber, Simic growth chamber or whatever land you need to, to go off. And plus you're playing a bunch of utility lands so it allows you to dig for utility lands. And he was saying, I don't understand why more Amulet players don't just play 61 cards in their main deck and take the Bajuka Bog that's typically played in the sideboard and play it main. Um, and then you play 14 cards in your sideboard so you can board out the Bajuka Bog if it's not good. And the like percentage your draws get worse by adding one more card to your main deck is outweighed by the fact that you can like search for this Bajuka Bog using, um, you know, Talarian, Talaria West or Titan Once Upon a Time or Titan and just like randomly win you game ones. Against um, like Dredge or any other right. all in graveyard right. decks. And like the amount of times where the 61 cards is going to matter is like negligible compared to the percentage you're going to gain from having this card in your main deck. And so... As a proof of concept, somebody did that uh, and top 32 the Modern Challenge. So uh, they are playing three Once Upon a Time, and I'm going to find their list. I didn't find it. I got too excited about talking about this because I think it's really cool. Um, when I saw it on Twitter as like a piece of theory from you know somebody who has probably not played the deck a ton um, but is familiar with the concept, kind of like, hey, why don't we do this? Uh, and somebody did it. So yeah, it, you're, you've got this uh, three Once Upon a Time deck with uh, obviously Amulet of Vigor, Ancient Stirrings, all that stuff. And then um, you can find the Bajuka Bog with Primeval Titan or um, Teleria West or Once Upon a Time. And it just like, somebody tried it out and they they 5 would So there were also in the Modern Classic two other Amulet Titan decks playing an identical list with the Bajuka Bog on the side. So somebody okay. decided to go for it and a couple other people didn't and they all found success but i'll be interested to see how this shakes out and i think it's like a cool piece of tech for modern where you don't usually think ah yes the tech is to play 61 <laughs> yeah and that was that exploits well that exploits but it utilizes a rule change that happened a few years ago that you were explaining to me that i i didn't even know about that allows you to play less than 15 cards in your sideboard right as long as you present when you present your deck, if you have 60 or more cards in your deck and less than 15 or less cards in your sideboard, that's a legal deck. So you can side one out and go to, you can start at 6114 and you can side one out to be at uh, 6015 and that's, that's legal. So theoretically, after game one, if I'm running a normal 6015, I could side in all 15 cards and not side out any cards and present a 75 card deck and that's fine. Yes. Huh. And that used to not be true. I forget what year they changed it, but I remember there were a bunch of articles from pros kind of like, what is the, like, why does this matter? What what can we do? Like, what is this? How can you use this rule change? And so there were people talking about, yeah, boarding in more cards than you board out or maybe having a... Like if you're against a mill deck and you're not hurt by adding a few more cards. Yeah, and in, in toolbox decks, kind of like bringing one in or like having a 61-14 or a 62-13 or something like that. Um, and there were I remember reading articles about it and it kind of never really was broken to the metagame. I don't know if that's because too few people tried it out or just by chance nobody found success and they decided it was bad or maybe it was bad but it's back um <laughs> in particular because of kind of the draw power of once upon a time and being able to like consistently find your bajuka bug in matchups where it matters but the mana base in that deck is so like carefully constructed because you need to be playing all these weird bounce lands and utility lands and enough basics to you know get pathed or whatever um that you can just you know have it be your 61st yeah that's kind of interesting i i, I think it would the this is kind of the perfect storm of why when this uh, when this uh tech would be viable because you would want to be able to play it you know if you're ever doing this like 61 14 in some other deck it would want to be a deck that has a search mechanism for the extra card uh and that extra card can't you know it's good that it's a land because bajuka bog even if you draw it in a in a game 
where you're, it's not going to be useful. It's still a land, and you're playing Amulet Titan, so if you have an Amulet, it's a land that'll enter be into the battlefield tap, untapped sometimes. Yeah. So, worst case scenario, it's just a waste, which is not the worst thing. You know, the, it's it's not as bad as a blank card, the way that, uh, you know, some 61st cards, like, you know, a, a, like a Ley Line of the Void is a blank card against a lot of decks. Yeah, and so, like, a lot of the discussion um, about kind of having more cards was centered around toolbox decks like i think at the time maybe birthing pod was legal or something and it was like you know decks like that where it's like i have this you know orzov pontiff in my sideboard is it worth playing 61 to have it main and like win a certain more percentage of game ones like is like the if you're shot calling ones, the metagame and the metagame is going to have a lot of x ones then maybe i want that pontiff in the main right like but you don't want to cut a card because a lot of time you can just find something to cut out of your toolbox deck when your toolbox is made of lands it can get a little trickier because you need to actually cast your spells but is having that one like silver bullet that you can tutor for worth just putting in the main is that going to win you enough game ones that it's worth the game ones where you draw it and then lose because it was a worthless card or whatever or like the the percentage that it made your draws a little bit worse right like yeah um just by, you know. Cool. But yeah, I thought that was a cool uh, proof of concept for something that I that Did intrigued you, me on You Twitter. should tweet it at Sam Black. Be like, look, someone someone worked on, someone took your oh, yeah. advice. Perhaps I will. Um, but yeah, so that's been uh, this week's episode of Masters of Modern. Uh, I want to point out to follow us on Twitter at the MMCast. You can follow me at Marsh Unfocused. Uh, you can follow me at Dudard, D-U-D-A-R-D-D. Uh, you can follow Alex and Ben, the usual Masters of Modern hosts. Alex is at Kess Wiley on Twitter, and Ben is at Ben Bateman Media. Yeah, so follow them on there. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, definitely hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you get notifications. Uh, if you're not watching this on YouTube, please go to YouTube and subscribe. Subscriptions is a great free way you can support the show that you love. Um, check out our Facebook group, the official Masters of Modern group. Just search for Masters it's of like Modern. It's like the biggest, mas- the biggest modern focused group on Facebook. So there's a lot of great discussion there. Even um, if you want to talk about weird fringy stuff or metagame decks or just like, you know, talk about results, whatever. It's all there. Yeah. Also check out the pa- our Patreon at uh, patreon.com slash the MMcast. Uh, our patrons get an exclusive, unedited, raw audio from th- every week's podcast. You can get weird conversations about creature types or movies or any yeah. number of things that we're talking about beforehand. Whatever uh, we had to cut for time. <laughs> and uh, Patreon helps. It helps grow the show. helps get us uh, better production values and, and that sort of thing. You also get access You get uh, access to a couple of exclusive uh, Discord channels on our Masters of Modern Discord. It's, it's smaller than the Facebook group, a little bit smaller, more intimate uh, conversations go on there. Uh, Alex and I are reasonably active, so it's an easier way to catch our eye. Uh, on discord than on facebook because facebook is so big we can't see everything (laughs) yeah Uh, make sure to subscribe on whatever podcasting platform that you're listening to this and uh, give it a review whether you're on stitcher or itunes or any of those things review so that other people can find the show let them know how much you love the masters of modern um yeah and so thanks for tuning in this week and bearing with michael and i so we make the oh, real and also MMcast. check out our uh sister show the command zone uh they do everything commander so if you are also interested in commander content they put out the best con- commander content on the webs on the web so uh yeah. yeah check out the command zone i'm pretty interested in commander content it's definitely my i'm so excited to go. build check out kenrith the, the king returned i'm gonna put tainted remedy in there and kill people with the white ability <laughs> I'm serious. I'm all about it. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. All right. Well, that has been this week's Masters of Modern. I guess yeah, we'll see you, see you next, next week. week. Peace out. Thank you for your attention. See you later, alligator. This has been a production of Time Traveler Media, sending podcasts into the future.